Uh, so I'm John Story. I, uh, I'm a web developer for the last years and so, and uh, was slightly on a libertarian view politically, and that's kind of why I got into like Bitcoin and the whole like government stuff. And um, around last uh, last Thanksgiving, I started to get pretty into it. I took a lot of like I did a lot of getting started and started to look into how to develop for things like Bitcoin. I was pretty much only into Bitcoin, and uh, I took a course. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's called the University of Nicosia's. It's a MOOC. It's their first course to their master's degree in um, crypto economics. And it's a, it's a really good course. And I started reading about all these different things. And I was like, OK, I'm a developer. I want to start like, using, these, using these platforms. So I tried starting to develop for like Bitcoin or looking into what was necessary. And it was really, really hard. And uh, that's when I kind of learned about Ethereum was this idea of somebody decided, OK, Bitcoin's a cool idea, but it's not very friendly for developers. And there's a lot more that we could build on, on this like global computing network. So they kind of started this Ethereum thing. And one of the core developers, after getting it up and running, kind of split off and decided, you know what, I'm going to build developer tools and infrastructure and hire a whole bunch of people to build applications for actual people to start using. And it's kind of been consensus is his branch of that. Um, that he basically goes in and the reason I ended up working for consensus is they made all the tools as a developer that made it easy to work um, with solidity and the develop applications for the blockchain and so um, So I started working for consensus. I work on a product called balance. That's an accounting. Who's my accounting guy? It's like an accounting triple entry our our mission our dream our goal is to do triple entry accounting but right now, it's pretty much just like financial transparency for ICO companies and people that are raising money that they can be more transparent to the government or their shareholders or whoever with how they're um, spending and using their money. So that's me. Uh, yeah. And this is, this is Joe. And I, I uh, want you to hear it. I'm going to see if we can hear it um, through his own words of kind of his journey. Uh, I thought it was really interesting. So let's see if... Uh, uh, mostly in technology with a smattering of finance uh, more recently. I studied electrical engineering and computer okay. science. Was that pretty bad? Uh, I couldn't understand why so many of my roommates and friends were econ majors. So Mike, JV, uh, uh, Dave, Rich. Um, science and technology was the only pursuit that made sense to me. And I felt the financial world was at best mundane. I was a computer nerd, grew up on Star Trek, read a decent amount of cyberpunk and sci-fi. It was obvious to me that the geeks would inherit the earth. Fast forward 15 years and I started a transition to the world of finance. I finally became aware of, and perhaps even started to understand a little bit, what I then thought of as the big game, finance, global finance economics, and geopolitics. I worked at Goldman for a little while and also with a software firm down on Broad Street, right by the New York Stock Exchange and beside the old Goldman mothership. One day on my way to work, I exited the subway, looked up into the beautiful sunny sky, uh, and saw charred pieces of paper raining down everywhere. After looking up for a few seconds, my eyes started to burn. Micronized jet fuel, perhaps. Curious fool that I was, I walked towards the event. I was walking towards an area it would later be called Ground Zero. It was September 11, 2001. I was about to be chased down the street by the pyroclastic flow that results when a very large building collapses on itself and effectively disintegrates. In a very big way, my world, everyone's world, changed on that day. Growing up, I and everyone I knew trusted society and the structures that we found ourselves embedded in. The 60s ushered in an early wake-up call with respect to the military-industrial complex. But then we hit snooze. The 70s ushered in disco. That ultimately proved fairly harmless. <laughs> uh, Tom Wolfe called the 70s the me decade. But I think we perfected selfishness in the 80s. Many called the 90s a great decade. I think that is partly because science and tech and general knowledge dissemination and communication took such tremendous leaps as our communications meshes and the internet began to ramify. The internet and mobile phones began to shrink the planet quite dramatically for many. 9-11 to me represented a loss of innocence, or perhaps a loss of naivete. 
and the many learnings and disclosures in the decade or so following 9-11 laid bare the complex and often unhealthy context that we were actually embedded in. Many discovered that it was folly to trust all those structures that we implicitly felt had our best interest at heart. Politicians, bankers, pharma companies, insurers, car companies, healthcare organizations, they were all focused on making a buck and really they couldn't care less about your well-being. Perhaps the fake news phenomenon is actually more honest. Perhaps it was always fake news to a significant degree, but we're just labeling it more accurately, accurately of late. 9-11 woke up many people. I and so many others became more interested in monetary theory, esoteric aspects of finance like mortgage-backed securities and collateralized debt obligations, geopolitics, hidden power structures. I did enough research back then and developed a deep enough understanding of the global economy and financial world to get quite depressed about it. I felt we were living in a global society and economy that was figuratively, literally, and morally bankrupt. 9-11 ushered in nearly a decade of aware people trying to wake others up from their slumber of innocence or their robotic existences in the major edifices of society. These people were trying to occupy everything just to get the message out, to get the message across. I normally not want to speak out at that point in my life, even started to send friends and family written thoughts and updates on events and concerns that I had. I was confident that our economy and society were in a slow cascading collapse and I only saw two outcomes. Central bankers would kick the can down the road for as long as possible, enabling the enormous debt in the system to be paid off with greatly devalued currency in a devaluation race to the bottom. This had the potential to stifle growth and, and broad prosperity for decades. Or more likely, some nonlinear collapse would bring great hardship, a more profound global depression than anything previous. I did hypothesize some possible magical escapes that would drive tremendous growth in the economy, free or very cheap energy, drastically reduced taxes, the ability to teleport anywhere on the globe instantly, uh, or more gloomily, World War III. Planning for the worst, I took a trip with my brother to Peru and Ecuador and even put in a bid on some land that could serve as an escape if necessary. I visited my friend Mike Novogratz one night to share my concerns and asked him if he was interested in being part of formulating an escape plan. To his credit, A, he was not concerned, and B, <laughs> he indicated that if shit were to hit the fan, he would want to face it with friends and family here in good old America. Mike is a patriot, and he would do what was required to fix the situation at home. And so it went. Later, in early 2011, I read the Bitcoin white paper written by Satoshi Nakamoto, person or group. I had the epiphany that so many in our space had. Decentralization was a game changer. Satoshi had invented a mechanism that could enable us to build far better alternatives to the legacy systems. Alternative structures for economic, social, and political systems that could exist on a foundation that could not be improperly manipulated. There was no longer any reason to get the message out. There was no reason to consider exit or escape. We could now focus on building, building better systems for a better future. That moment, my attitude turned from disillusioned back to my natural state, which is idealistic, optimistic, generally positive. I jumped into the Bitcoin system informally. Basically, I read everything for a couple of years, but I didn't go to any events or, or really meet anybody in the space. When I read the white paper by Vitalik Buterin describing the Ethereum platform, it crystallized for me all the potential with which I felt the Bitcoin white paper was pregnant. Bitcoin taught us that we had a new paradigm that we could use to build better systems. And now with Ethereum, Vitalik showed us in some detail a scalable method for building systems that would change everything. I jumped in completely. Decentralization. So that's kind of an intro. So that's the, uh, that's the founder of Consensus. Um, so he had kind of this big, like, he, he traces it back to kind of these bigger issues and he decided, you know what, let's jump in. Being a computer science, being involved in finance, he felt like he was pretty well. So he joined with Vitalik and about eight others and they developed out the Ethereum kind of blockchain. And uh, basically it's been him and, hold that, isn't right. And then uh, since on about 400 other people have joined consensus and we're kind of 
going along with Joe on this uh, adventure and journey to try to decentralize everything. It's this idea that eventually decentralized systems will be the way of the future, and he's basically just sticking his finger in as many pots as he can to say, everything needs to kind of go through this transformation, um, we have new systems, and so that's kind of like a background as to the founder and kind of the, you know, the, culture, the culture driver of, uh, of consensus. Um, so what is consensus then? Like, uh, what, what do we do? So this is our uh, lately, it's kind of, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna warn you that a lot of things that I'm gonna end up saying tonight are like very, uh, in consensus we call it meshy, as in like messy or mushy. Uh, it's very, everything's very flexible. I could show you a similar version of this that we had maybe six months ago and there would be different projects up and different, um, like just different talking points. But so basically we're just kind of in a constant like flux of people having ideas and saying, hey, we should really work towards this. But this is kind of the, and I can send this to anybody that's interested, but essentially we have uh, like hardcore infrastructure things. So he basically went off and said, okay, in order for everybody to use um, a blockchain, we don't really expect everybody to uh, actually have a version of the blockchain running. If any of you guys are know, like in order to have an actual Ethereum blockchain, it's like 150 gigabytes on your computer running. And he's like, well, you know, is that, are we actually gonna be able to scale that? It's like, well, no, so we're gonna create a thing called Infura. And Infura basically is like a trusted um, Ethereum node that if you just wanna do something from your phone or something, it's basically like an API that you can subscribe to and that will broadcast transactions. You still sign things with your own keys and private keys and everything, but you basically send that transaction to them and they'll broadcast it to the, to the network. And uh, actually, I think I go through some of these. Okay, so this is basically Infura. Right here you have a map of kind of where different people are using it. They get about 1.2 billion requests per day, people running things on top of the Infura network that aren't, just, aren't downloading the full blockchain but wanting to interact with it in some way. Um, but yeah, that's basically what they do is just provide a trusted Oracle system. Um, they also have tools such as MetaMask. Um, MetaMask is, it, and unless, depending on how technical you guys are, these are all tools that me as a developer, as I was trying to develop, I would look for tools like MetaMask which enable you to write a normal app and have it be on a browser so people can go to like Chrome and still interact with it. Um, if you guys are familiar, there's other ways of doing dApps, like uh, Carl's doing one that you actually have to have it on your computer. Um, there's other systems that you basically have to download special browsers in order to interact with the blockchain. But these guys are a, uh, a Chrome extension. If you can see, I've actually got them up here that basically let you um, have different accounts. These are all different like Ethereum accounts and you can just keep it in your browser and interact with block dApps that people build the blockchain on normal browser. Um, here's their, their users, they're growing really fast. Um, here's some like, they're not super big, right? Like 6,000 Twitter followers, like how big is that, right? But in the developer ecosystem, it's like a pretty awesome uh, thing if you're trying to develop with, uh, with Ethereum. So they're behind these guys and then Truffle is basically a, uh, another developer tool that people use in order to deploy things to the blockchain. If anybody here has tried developing four blockchains, um, it's a really big hassle. You have to compile things in a special way and then you have to, there's different networks and then in your code, when you deploy something to a network, you have to keep track of the address that it sends it to. So for example, right now, how internet works is you will create like a, you have like your local machine where you're developing things and then you'll push it up to a server that is mapped to www dot whatever like address it is. But the blockchain doesn't really work like that. And so whenever you push a, a program or a smart contract to a blockchain, it will assign you your address and you don't get to choose like what your address is. And so with that address, there's like this weird, anyways, it's kind of a hassle in the developers world to keep track of what all these different addresses are for the different contracts you've deployed. And they basically, Truffle is like a, uh, a way that will auto-compile, auto-detect bugs, and then keep track of where all your addresses are so that you can reference it in your JavaScript really easily and just say, oh, this, you don't even have to deal with addresses at all. You just say, my deployed contract, and it'll just know where it's been deployed to. And 
it's just a, a very nice feature for developers that they uh, maintain. So that's another tool. Um, along with that, so I kind of went through like, so they basically help develop Ethereum, and then they're like, okay, what do we need in order for like more developers to use it, more people to use it? Let's build some infrastructure, let's build some developer tools, and then let's build some like core components like for identity, for like signing in, basically like sign in with Facebook. They're like, well, we're not using, we're not trusting Facebook, so we're gonna create this decentralized way of signing into applications, which is their like uPort tool, or you can use MetaMask that basically keeps your identity on your browser. Um, but they, they started to get into these like, so they started as base as they could, and that was like, you know, three years ago, four years ago, and they've just been slowly like moving up the chain. And now, if you see, there's like balance up there, so that's the, the spoke or the, the like small team so, so consensus has about 400 people, but we break into small teams that are working on different projects. And my team's maybe about, it ranges from 10 to 15 people, depending on how excited other people are about joining it or leaving it at some point. So I just want to like, make sure I'm understanding this. All of these projects came from consensus? Uh-huh. I have no idea. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so, and some of them, like Gnosis, this one. No, they're still in. Gnosis uh, started as like a group, like they did a startup, right? They're like saying, hey, we're gonna do this. But then Consensus came in and said, hey, we can like open up your exposure to the ecosystem and we can provide you with people. And so they've kind of like, some people call them, uh, when I go to like blockchain conferences, some people call them uh, the Borg, meaning like uh, you either assimilate in or like, it's like, they like to say, oh, you're doing something interesting? Like, we can help you do it better. So like, assimilate in with us. And some people are like, counterculture, right? So it's like, no, the bigger that you guys get, like, because we're all into decentralization. So it's kind of like this playful thing. I view it as playful, but who knows, like, other people's actual intentions behind it. Uh, but so they basically just start uh, saying, oh, this is interesting, we can help you. Come in and join us, and we'll like, give you resources or help you with different things. So they don't. Okay. Um, so let me hurry and see if I have that on my next. Uh... So Infura is just barely starting with a revenue model. Right now they've just been opening up their API free to use. Like you just go on, register, and they just broadcast transactions for you, which is really awesome. You still have to pay the gas price because it's coming from your account. Like in the transaction, you authorize them to spend the gas price if you're familiar with the technical stuff behind it. Uh, but they'll just broadcast it for you. But they're just running their servers completely at cost. And so, uh, but they've been looking into, they just barely came up with a payment model. They're still gonna offer it free for everybody, but when people do like token sales, anybody that's into ICO stuff, um, they usually go through like how to do it, and it usually refers to MetaMask or My Ether Wallet. And My Ether Wallet and MetaMask both use Infura on the background to actually broadcast their transactions. And so, Basically, they're coming up with a payment model for people that are doing ICOs to get faster throughput uh, for people that are trying to uh, participate in the ICOs. So they, they're, they're starting to go down a, a payment model, but it hasn't been fully like set in stone yet. They're still like trying to figure out the best way to do it, to not alienate developers coming in, but still have people pay for when they're going above and beyond uh, just a, hey, I'm just doing it in my basement. Um, or even on a small startup scale, it's just fine. Um, so this kind of talks about kind of the mentality behind it. So right now we have these peer-to-peer -peer companies that in order for you to get into the peer-to-peer -peer network, you have to join Uber, right? You can't just say, well, I'm an Uber driver and never go through the Uber like ecosystem. So they're, they're centralized peer-to-peer -peer platforms and kind of the vision is this idea that through code and through protocol like email, that anybody can start an email server in the same way that anybody would be able to to open up their own peer-to-peer -peer, um, car driving app or Airbnb. It's kind of the idea behind a lot of the, uh, the products and stuff they're developing. And I didn't have a slide in here, but to touch on Carl's, so the major part of their uh, actual money that they have coming in is through consulting. So they have a lot of offices, they do a lot of things with like Fortune 500 companies consulting because they're original developers of Ethereum. Um, they have a, a good sway into how to influence how, how the platform grows and different features to build. So when? Um, as I said, this happened a couple years ago, but we're just, it's everything's ASAP. Everything in this world is like, 
hey, we're coming out with a white paper, hey, we're gonna have our proof of concept out. Like, there's just this mad rush right now to get um, applications in the hands of users. And so like, the when is just ASAP. There's like, it's just going as fast as we can and sometimes it's, uh, it's hard. But we'll touch on that. So next question is where? And here we have uh, some different areas where the little black, I don't know how update, up to date this is, but the black uh, little icons are personnel. The red are office locations. And I know that we have one in San Francisco now, so I, I think this is a little bit dated. But uh, basically we're just doing these, they're kind of spread out. Uh, it's, it's remote first is their idea. So everything is run they do have like hubs, like you can see there are definite places where people, you know, there's more people in Toronto, more people in New York, people in London, like they have hubs of where just talent is. So they provide offices for those areas, but even when people, so my team, uh, like I was saying, there's about 10 people, three of them or four of them are in New York, but only two of them really ever go into the office and the other two work from home, even though they're in New York, but they just prefer to work from home because every single day we do standups and everything is, you have to treat everything as if everybody is remote. So everything is like done on video calls and uh, yeah, video calling is like a big part of the consensus culture and most of the time people are spread out. So in my team we have some of the people that are in Brazil, you can't really see their little thing, but Brazil, Canada, Michigan, here in Utah and then that's in New York is kind of like where our team is. So you just kind of coordinate with uh, people in their time zones and sometimes it's a hassle but his idea is this decentralized and in order to do it decentralized he's allowing decentralized uh, like spaces. Bill was in town last week. Oh he was? Oh! Uh, Joe Lovin was? Yeah. At the, at the blockchain Utah meetup? Oh wow I had no idea. I don't know. There's three of us, there's three people that work. Um, no, I guess there's only two people that work for Consensus here in Utah. But that's really interesting. I had no idea. Hey, it's probably so because of PGO, uh, Patrick Barnes, New Exchange, that's SEC regulated, the ICO is like blue. Yeah, that's going to be a really cool deal. Um, and here's like the Ethereum Alliance. Basically this is like a group that they formed of different like Fortune 500 companies or just big companies to basically give input on what features or things Ethereum needs to build out in order to be successful with businesses. So businesses can be like, hey, we really need you know, fast, we need scaling or they can talk about privacy things or how Ethereum will address different features moving forward. Um, and then the why. So I have one last thing, this is only uh, about two minutes of Joe talking about the why, why behind all of the things that he's doing. No, I think it's just recording for the video. Our society is structured by and run by many centralized entities, companies, governments, some of which are covert. This works reasonably well and has brought us very far, but there is tremendous room for improvement. Top-down command and control as an organizing principle has enabled us to make tremendous gains globally as a society. It is an optimal architecture when communication and decision-making are slow and expensive. But top-down command and control has serious weaknesses. Decisions are made at the top as far as possible from where the real data and the real expertise are located. There's a tendency to silo information both laterally and vertically. Your boss gives you info on a need-to-know basis. You give your boss and peers only the info that you think serves you best, not what is best for the situation. You certainly don't share freely with your peers and other branches of the hierarchy. They might move up faster than you. All this is done to grow and consolidate power and to avoid being usurped. Finally, hierarchies are easily calcified and brittle. They don't adapt to novel situations very fluidly. Top-down command and control has served us very well. It has built, enabled us to build a great civilization. But importantly, it has brought us to the point technologically where we're enabled to build a decentralized society. Over the past few decades, we've wrapped the world in layers of communication networks. 
Nine years ago, Satoshi made a major breakthrough in computer science, enabling all actors on a blockchain platform to come to a decision within 10 minutes, even if up to half of those actors are malicious. Ethereum has pared that down to 14 seconds and very soon four seconds. In this context in which communications are ubiquitous, instant, and cheap, and decision-making by consensus can be cheap and rapid, an organizing principle relying on consensus among a richly communicating horizontal group of actors provides the most effective paradigm. It will take time, but once built out, flatter, decentralized economic, social, and political systems will be more effective, more fluid, and far less subject to corruption. Decentralization and horizontal infrastructure implies this. So basically, his big bet is that a decentralized company is going to be, in the long run, a more fluid and better company. So right now, consensus, there really is kind of one boss, and it's Joe. And people are encouraged to try joining teams. Like I've shown you, there's that big like, list of projects that are going on. There's about 400 people. And everything is based off of, imagine it as if you're like in high school, and people are trying to convince you to come like to uh, you know, math class, saying that math class is like where the future is going to be. Or there's another class, another like club. And you know, there's kind of like club presidents, the people that have kind of like been working with it for a long time that are trying to like do, help you and they're kind of like have more respect and they kind of like push along the project. But at any point, so essentially like uh, we call them spoke leads. Um, like for instance, I'm, when I joined Consensus, I was the only front end developer. And so I kind of made a pledge to be like, okay, I'm gonna stick with ba balance until we can like get to an MVP or get something in the hands of users. But at some point, I'm gonna be interested in exploring like open law that's tying smart contracts to legal contracts, you know? And I kind of wanted this flexibility to be able to, uh, you know, like look around at other projects. And basically consensus is saying, you know, that's fine. Just like as long as everybody that you're working with knows that that's the situation, like you're free to like create your own employment uh, like responsibilities. And if you find that you're not meshing well with the team, you just kind of, it's like a, it's like a try a couple different places before you decide to like say that you don't want to be part of consensus. Because each like little subset of people like has a different working culture and different stand up, like there's not a lot of processes. It's kind of up to each team to kind of determine how they're going to run their product. And it's, it's a really sometimes uh, frustrating experience because there aren't like strict lines, but like he's saying his hope in the experiment is that uh, like winners will evolve better and it will just be a more flexible working situation. So that's like his big hope for consensus is uh, from what I gather anyways and what the, uh, And that's pretty much all I have to present. I wanted to open it up for Q&A if anybody had any other questions. Um, yeah? Last week I was going to get on MetaMask, and then today I'm going to get on MetaMask. And I see all kinds of static out there saying it's got problems right now. Well, let them fix it first. So they, have, they just released a bug bounty for a bug that had to do with seed phrases. And they don't actually know if it's a bug or not. They've had people writing in that basically, the, if you guys are familiar with mnemonic uh, seed phrases, that some of the seed phrases that they spit out aren't actually, when they go to re-put them in and import in another browser, that they're not given the same accounts again. But nobody from MetaMask is able to recreate it, so they don't know if it's a user error. And because it's all like decentralized and it's not done through their servers, so they don't have records of everybody's seed addresses and they can't just like go recreate it. But they have been hearing like these issues. Some people have been saying that it doesn't work. So they've released a bug bounty saying, if somebody can, can recreate this and show that it's an actual bug, we'll give them X amount of money to prove that it is an actual bug and not just, because a, a lot of people are thinking it's a user error, that people are just being confused and they're not doing it right. Undocumented feature. Uh, undocumented feature, exactly. So anyways, that's some interesting MetaMask things. Yeah? Okay, so yes, I was going to touch on that. I didn't. So one of their spokes that they have is called uh, Consensus Academy. And basically, there's a site called B9, if any of you have been looking into uh, online education. B9 offers some Ethereum and blockchain courses. And uh, Consensus basically has a thing called Consensus Academy, where after you go through and uh, apply, they'll talk to you. 
And then if you get selected, they'll give you free access to this B9 course and let you graduate. And uh, I was a mentor for that. And it's a really good, it is a really, it's the best Ethereum. I haven't done, obviously, all courses in the world, but it's the best, if you're looking into uh, becoming a developer on Ethereum using like Solidity, they go over some interesting design patterns like hub and spoke, how to deploy contracts from other contracts, and how to do upgradable contracts, um, which is like a big issue right now is this idea that once you submit a program, right now with normal servers, you know like when you get updates for Apple, right? It says, oh, there's a new thing available, do you just want to just download it? With blockchains, it doesn't work like that because it's so immutable. Once you post it, it's there forever, and you can't do anything to it. So in order to do an upgrade, they have to post a completely new one and tell everybody else, okay, now you have to use this one. And it gets a little bit messy, so there's been like some lately some talks about how to set up architecture so that contracts can at one point point to this contract, and then after you upgrade, take that down and say point to this other new version that I just submitted. And so if you're interested in that, Aragon um, at DevCon that was just a couple weeks ago gave a presentation on their their proposed uh, solution for doing smart contract upgradable. So um, I, I don't know if you were to come up with one word, maybe it would be decentralization, perhaps. So with that, I'm curious, in your observation, are there, with, with that many people battling perhaps the conflicting philosophies and ideas and whatnot, I'm just curious, do you see much splintering going on? Would you be surprised if consensus ends up being four organizations Five years or so, or? You know, that's an interesting question. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if groups split off because they've talked about that. At what point does MetaMask or Truffle or Infura just say, hey, we're not really part of consensus anymore? Consensus just kind of acted as like an incubator at that point, and then they're just all doing their own things. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there were definite, and I would say that there are, there are already, already definite, like, um, like, yeah, camps, I guess is a way to say it. Like some people are definitely more, um, obviously with like the influx of ICOs, um, some people are a little bit more like financial, like token sell, and so they're like leading this camp of basically doing like token services and doing consulting for companies that are doing token sales. And then there are other people inside of consensus that are like, why are we even doing these things for token sales? Like it's not helping the hardcore technology advance. Like we should be dedicating our, sor our resources here fully for building um, like a developer tools. Like why are we even messing around with these ICOs? They just want money. But then there are other people in the ecosystem in consensus that say, well, the more, the more projects that get started, the more people get acquainted to it, like it's actually helpful. And so yeah, there are these competing, these competing camps. And essentially it comes back to, and again, it's basically like, think of it like a, a high school or a social club where you know, somebody just goes and starts something and it can grow to a certain extent until the principal is like, hey, that's like not okay, we need to like address this. But like for, for somewhat, there's like this autonomy just to be like, I think this thing should exist, so like I'm gonna go talk to other people that I know that are in my camp and see if I can get them to dedicate some of their time working on you know, this thing that I think is really important for the space. Yeah. Uh, political motivation or a social motivation for social change. Other people are in it just for the money, frankly. And so, as you have these bi bathroom ideologies, it's just interesting how that plays out. And I think it'll still stay as like one consensus, but right now it's, it's very voluntary. Like, if you don't want to show up to some meeting, um, I mean, they'll, I, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but like, I mean, there'll be times where they'll say, hey, we're going to do, a, we're going to give a training on how to validate customers that we think everybody in the whole entire mesh, like everybody should come to this meeting. But like only maybe half of the people will show up because people are just like, oh, we're just busy working on our thing or we're doing something else. And so it's kind of like this idea of you can subscribe to whatever culture that you want to. Um, and who knows if it'll change? Like we, they say it all the time, they'll preface a lot of things with this is an experiment. And so I don't really expect the consensus that exists today. You know, next year they could just say, well, you know, it didn't really work for this sort of a thing, or this we felt like didn't really work, so we're kind of shutting this down. Or, and it's constantly evolving. Like just today, um, I got an email asking people, they have a thing called the Resource Allocation Committee, 
and basically think of it as like a venture group. It's basically Joe and maybe like 10 other people that are kind of like trusted circle that have a lot of startup experience and people pitch ideas to them and they'll be like, yes, we want to like pay money for this or yeah, we should try to get like 10 developers working on this thing. Like people present ideas and they just basically said, we're trying to maybe not do it where there's just like 10 decision makers and if you would like to be involved in this process, like submit us, uh, they had a Google form and they said, tell us like why you think you should be on one of these groups that kind of helps make decisions on how to um, allocate resources within consensus rather than leading up to like a, a board essentially that we have. And so, it, yes, Sam? that and I and my relationship with consensus is more like consensus is an angel investor or the reputation spoke so the idea is to build something to spin out and so it's it's a you know it's like all all the all the ranges of possible interactions exist in consensus from from me just being like I'll do anything you want consensus because I want to develop for the blockchain where Sam was like hey, I, I want to do my specific thing and I want to have like a way more control over how it gets done. I just want help with some developer resources. Yeah, yeah. so Sam is also a consensus member. Uh, yeah, I could, uh, I should probably give you, let's hurry and uh, I probably have it up actually. So this is what I'm working on, it's called Balance. Uh, it's basically, so the idea is that um, Ethereum, like transactions, right, right now there's things like um, Mint or things that let you classify all your transactions. And with blockchain, you just do transactions but you don't know like Visa knows where you're spending your money because they have like a merchant file for where that thing's going. So it lets you say, this is a restaurant and this is a whatever. And because other people classify that transaction, it, anyways, they have their like centralized way of determining what different transactions are. Well, in blockchain, that doesn't really exist yet. So we're basically building a, a, a tool for people to basically have like a, a chart of accounts so they can, um, like outline what their assets are, what liabilities are, basically all their accounting sort of stuff that they need to do bookkeeping. And then on the actual transfers, like, so here's a list of different ERC20 tokens. So this is like a oh my's go if you're into OMG. I'm not sure what pay is. And then here's some like ether transactions. But basically it lets you classify to say, oh, this is for like inventory. And you can classify it, uh-oh. And again, I'm like, this is, my actual local, so I'm like debugging stuff. But it lets you, so classify this. And again, we have multiple phases of how we're hoping to advance. Right now it's very, it is kind of a centralized service because we scrape the blockchain in order to do faster transactions and allow people to manipulate their data how they want to. And obviously companies are a little bit more like uh, into privacy and not actually like telling everybody what everything is. And so, yeah. And uh, I said on my bank uh, account Coinbase. So um, would that like cover it? Like, would you well, be able to make your own so transactions? Coinbase works because it was a fiat transaction. You bought X amount of Ethereum for $300. So there was like cash money going to a vendor to turn into crypto. Once it's in crypto world, like you sending one Ether to X address, like there's no centralized repository that says this address belongs to you know, somebody in the audience. So this is doing all just uh, transactions on the blockchain and letting you classify. It doesn't really do fiat to ether or ether to fiat. So we're not doing US dollar transactions. Like flag, yeah, like a. 
Yeah. So that's why you use, somebody here was talking about they do like a local Bitcoin token thing. So that's why people do local Bitcoins is this idea that if you do transactions, if you work with an exchange service, the thing with the exchanges is it's highly regulated. So anytime you go in, you execute a position in or out of crypto, the government will quote unquote know about it. Unless you do something like local Bitcoins that just aligns like peer to peer transactions where you say, hey, I have a Bitcoin I want to sell or I want to buy and just hooks up buyers and sellers to do it in like no channel at all, no like, but if you're using an exchange like Coinbase or Pol Poloniex or Kraken or something, uh, that's just part of the game. You have to give them your social security number and you have to, and, but it's the government just, and so, but there's a big thing around, yeah, the gates of going in and out of crypto are still highly regulated because it interacts with the US dollar. So the government has ways of, cracking down. But once it's in crypto land, it's kind of like mystery, like you can do whatever you want with it. It's just the ins and out, the gates. And but. in all honesty, the employee of a banking system there, um, it's more like automated suites of uh, like you can get higher up level and other higher level entities to find like potentially identify you. Like they've all just a team of like Coinbase has, yeah. Um, Any other questions? Oh, and yeah. You can go, you'll go first and then. Um, you talked about consensus kind of being like a board and you might get a civil like <laughs> Would there be a situation like myself where, where I'm in development right now of a token and um, let's say I just wanted to uh, go to a company there are a number of good coins, uh, but you know, I could just go to consensus and say, you know, I can hit up your uh, resource allocation group, is what you call it, and, uh -huh. and say, you know, how about it, guys? What do you think about this? And then basically turn it over or get assimilated or, or expand on that. And, that. and it might be, because uh, I don't have personal experience with that, but it sounds kind of that's what, like, you did, Sam. But Sam was in conversations with him for maybe six months? Four months. Four months. So it, it, it is a longer process. My, my like hiring process took five months. And so, yeah, basically you would reach out to them and you would start to provide like, hey, I'm doing this project. They would probably have somebody, they'd probably like hook you up. You'd probably have to have at least somewhat of a white paper done of like explaining like what you're trying to do. And then basically they would, and again, I don't really know because I don't do this every day. So it's like not my branch of consensus, but I'm assuming they would hook you up with somebody from their like uh, vetting their like project vetting because they just barely opened up a VC fund as well for people that didn't want to come into consensus but that consensus still was like this is a killer idea yeah we want to buy like a portion of your and basically being only venture capital they just did it just like a couple weeks ago so it's like really so new you'd be connecting with the right department, um yeah I would be able to message somebody that would be able to tell me who to connect you to yeah and uh And so that would be, I mean, that's what Sam's looking for too right now, right? So there's, there's there's uh, what's the standard of gravity of about 40 or 50 developers? And it was actually, I thought it was, I was surprised at the quality, to be honest. Because um, I went to, they had their hackathon in Dubai. And we did, I could show you our, uh, we made like a little proof of concept for DAOs for like, being able to, when somebody does something on the blockchain, you get a text message to say, hey, so-and-so did this, like, do you want to say yes or no or vote, basically? And then it goes back on the blockchain um, to basically say, hey, do we want to spend $5 on pizza? And people would say yes or no. And I was actually very impressed with the Consensus Academy, the people that had gone through the course and then went to the hackathon. Uh,
of the, yeah. So, um, but Consensus Academy, if anybody's interested in looking into learning, if you're, obviously, like Carl said, they look for people. It's not like, <coughs> it's not like if you develop for blockchain, it's like in a silo. Like, you have to kind of understand other existing web technologies and how it fits in, because it's, a lot of people say it's like the new internet, but it's like, it really is just like a new database on top of the internet that enables, it's kind of like, I was talking to uh, Jeff earlier today about this, but it's like saying um, app, like apps or native started to come out, um, like mobile native, where like mobile phones didn't like reinvent the internet, they just like enabled a new class of apps to be made that people used in a different way than how they used them on a computer. It's kind of the same thing that basically they created this blockchain, and it's not like replacing it. There'll still be like Amazon and Facebooks and Googles and stuff, but it's just creating a new class of apps and a new class of understanding and thinking about like your data and like how you deal with money that hasn't existed before. So there's like a new, a new like opening field of the internet that now is becoming possible. But like still, internet. It's not going to like replace everything on the internet, and you're never going to use normal websites. Like that, in my opinion, won't happen. Um, yeah. So I want to pick you on pick you back up on that. Very new to the blockchain development team. Um, I'm trying to get a consensus of when to decentralize. Okay. So, like everyone seems to have a bit of a different opinion on it. Like earlier you mentioned that um, consensus is trying to decentralize everything. Mm -hmm. um, is there ever a time when you're like that would be a terrible idea? Like what what are the, what are the cons to decentralizing? To, Yeah, and that's a really good, so right now there's a hype bubble. There's like a hype, a cycle of blockchain. So a lot of projects are being developed and there's a couple of really good articles that talk about the need for tokens. But sometimes people just have existing businesses that they're just saying, okay, we're just gonna do our existing business and just put a token on it so that we can raise a whole bunch of money to like fund our thing. And then there are some applications that are like, oh no, this is like an actual change of the way that this organization is gonna work. But right now in the ecosystem, you'll see both types. Like you'll see people just trying to raise money that aren't like super into the technical aspects of it or that could like build another solution just using Ethereum that they don't need to create a whole new token network for. Um, so it's, it's a tricky question. Um, I, I would say my personal opinion is that you should, you should look for centralization. I feel like centralization is much cheaper and much easier than decentralized. So in my opinion, it's a new database. So you'll still have like an app with existing database functionality and like standalone app. But when you need to make something public that you want to be able to control still. So if you ever want to like have a, uh, something uploaded to like Google Drive that you still want to be able to control or have logic over money like escrow accounts, those are like the two main things that I think are the biggest, because this is the first time that we've been able to have quote unquote programmable money. And so there's, that's where a lot of the hype in the space right now is over like market things and like money sort of based things because we've never been able to have the freedom to transact so fluidly without like intermediaries being like, hey, we have to watch over stuff.
And that's, that's exactly what Balance is. Balance has, right now, we don't do any interactions with the blockchain. The only thing that we do on the blockchain is read transactions from it and then give you a, basically just your own database of your transactions and let you classify and manipulate it in order to create um, like financial statements and like your taxes or like basically transparency things easier. Um, and the idea is that we're gonna move into blockchain stuff with basically allowing people to start paying payroll with blockchain. But our initial first step was just to solve like a basic problem that people were having that didn't have anything to do with actually transacting on the blockchain. And so there's, I think there's a lot of value to be created in a non-blockchain way. But because it's such a hype thing, um, it's almost like if you're going to do an ICO, you've got to be talking about blockchain stuff. And like, rather than trying to build out your product and like get it actually traction to actually raise money from a VC, if you just put blockchain in the words and then write it like a white paper and like get a team, like you could possibly raise money to do your idea. So it's just kind of like people are like, oh, let's just like jump on this. But so I don't see, I see a lot of projects that I don't feel like are necessary for blockchain. But again, that's just m the eyes of me and like everybody has well, different opinions. And I would say that another, the another one besides just technical aspects is just like cultural, like you being like onboarded on having an actual Ethereum address and knowing about transactions. Like in order to get somebody to use your app, if you're trying to educate them about Ethereum and then about your app, it's like, that's like so much education where if people get more and more like knowledgeable about how it works, then it's like, okay, I get it. Now t tell me about your app. And so it's like this cultural, I don't feel like people are ready to just be like, I'm gonna do, and unless there's some like special use case like investing where it's like, oh, if I 
if I like learn about this and watch a whole bunch of videos, I might be able to like double my money in the next month. If I, so that's like a big motivator of people like, okay, I'm gonna figure this out because I see people making money, whereas there's not like a huge app that people are like, oh, I'm gonna learn all about Ethereum so that I can like do this app that keeps track of my health history or something. Like, it's just not compelling enough yet. Where I think a lot of, like, we're, we're trying, obviously, we're kind of probably one of the more uh, cutting edge in terms of trying to make a fully decentralized product. Um, and where I see a compelling value proposition is in um, being able to say that, like, you don't have to worry about what infrastructure you're running on if you use our system, and that you also are limiting the potential for um, disclosing too much information. So from a corporate perspective, um, a lot of companies are moving away from being responsible for all the data that they're, that's going through their systems. And, and so like Apple, for example, was recently asked by the FBI if they would unlock an iPhone. And they just, even if they complied with that request, they opened themselves up for all sorts of lawsuits and other challenges by doing that. And so if they can minimize the vector of the data that they're responsible for, then that's a really compelling value proposition for a business. So I think some of the value that, that these kind of systems will add might be more appealing to businesses to begin with. And then later on, um, trickle down to consumer as the consumer becomes more uh, like just conscientious about who's got their data and what they're doing with it. I think that everyone's getting a little leery of like Facebook and Google and others, and the way they sort of almost have this like um, clairvoyance about what it is you're interested in, and you're like, how do they know that? <laughs> and people are just getting a little worried about that. So I think that um, the the more we move, like the more people see the potential challenges there, that they might want no, 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 to go. No, yeah. No, Any other questions? Well, All right. So they have a branch called Token Services okay. that is doing that. They're doing it right now for a ICO called Leverage, I think. Okay. Um, if you've seen that, as like, uh huh. Which some people, again, in consensus, are like. Why are we even, like, they'll post on the Slack, like, why are we even messing with these guys? This feels, like, so shady. And other people in consensus are like, no, like, it's a thing. We got to do this. And, like, anyways, it's just, there's, like, there are different camps of people that, uh, like, some people think, yeah, let's do it. And some people think, no, we shouldn't do it. And it's this idea of being fluid enough to let them explore. And, you know, maybe they're onto something really good. And that's going to actually, like, power consensus to, like, become profitable for doing other things. Like, they're trying to, to not be super stifling of people's interests and what people want to do and let, let things grow organically and like actually let people try to succeed rather than being like, no, this is like our one mission statement and this is the one thing that all, everybody's doing. We're all, which anyways, I won't get into like, uh, like political theory, but uh, it's interesting. It's, it's an experiment for sure. So that's a good question. Um, there. <clears throat> so there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, quote unquote a lot of people will start branding themselves as Ethereum killers, or like um, one was Tezos. Yeah. That's like a blockchain that's coming up. Um, another one is like. Are they dead? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Yeah, 
Some other ones are Neo. Neo is the Chinese kind of version. They're like, we're the Chinese version of Ethereum that also does uh, C sharp, allows you to write smart contracts in C sharp. Um, one's called EOS, Waves. Um, Definity is one that's coming up that some people are excited about. What? Yeah, EOS? RSK. We EOS. Yeah, RSK. And um, they're basically taking all of the same Ethereum solidity kinds of features and making them work on Bitcoin and potentially other blockchains as well. So Because if it works on Bitcoin, it'll work on like Doge, Dogecoin and Litecoin <laughs> and mainly Dogecoin. That's the one everybody's excited about. <laughs> You know, that's an interesting question. There have been talks about cross-chain like portals, like how do how do you do how do you like verify transactions on Bitcoin using Ethereum? But I don't see I see them being full. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I don't know. I haven't looked. I don't know technically um, all these different projects, but uh, I would say it's safe to say that consensus is like pure Ethereum. Um, who knows if in ten years people are like we're trying to do something else, but just because Joe's one of the original founders of Ethereum and the kind of like Ethereum is the thing that they're building all their developer tools for, I would see consensus sticking pretty hard. And the, the goal of consensus is for if another blockchain comes out that has some sort of feature, that it's in a healthy enough environment that it's not like a Bitcoin, like always hard forking or like, hey, we want to do this thing. The idea is that they want to be fluid enough to be able to be like, oh, that's a great idea that was implemented by this other blockchain. Let's bring that in and still take advantage of all the developer tools that we've built for this existing blockchain and just like pick and choose different features. Because any decentralized system, anyways, they're give and take, they're like trade-offs. But the idea is that, like Carl was saying, RSK is looking at Ethereum and saying, okay, well, let's build these things into Bitcoin. Some other blockchain comes up that does something new and then Ethereum will say, oh yeah, we should have that and bring this in. And the idea is that hopefully it'll evolve. and But there will eventually be multiple blockchains. I don't think there's any sort of like, Ethereum will be the only blockchain or Bitcoin will be the only blockchain. It's a general consensus that, yeah, there's going to be like a whole bunch of different ones. Did, OK, yeah. So in December, they're looking at opening up futures for Bitcoin. OK. And I was wondering if you Are you talking about like on like the stock? Like, like stock. Like stocks? say that adding this institutional money to it is probably going to increase. Uh, that's what I would view, okay, but. I saw a news report today that some company re renamed themselves and added blockchain. I just saw it today. And their stock increased by 374% of the place. Just on the board. Overstock has done the same thing. Overstock is basically a $500 million company, from what I understand, right? A year ago, Overstock was their market cap was $500 million. Then they said, hey, we're going to buy some of this, and we're going to get the blockchain back, and now their stocks are tripled in value, right? And of course, they're, they're allegedly, anyways, trying to raise a $500 million 
ICO, which, whatever you think about that, there's no question that people, that, that money has been coming into these companies just because institutional money wants to play in this space, they can't. They're, they're prohibited from doing so in a lot of the traditional ways. They can't just go open a Coinbase account and start buying. So yeah, I mean, I, I think the answer is absolutely. There's, you know, these are these, like, financial markets are so big that they're almost impossible to well, this is like in the nature of the blockchain. Like this is like the most compelling use case. Get rid of, get rid of all the middlemen. I mean, and obviously the most powerful. I mean, that's so. Is so anything like, financial? Right. Like, yes. There's like eight trillion dollar industries right now in the, in the financial markets that blockchain just can chop out if you can get the the, the legal and regulatory stuff right. So that's exactly what Overstock has done. Like Patrick Byron, he's like so. T zero, that's what they're doing, and the reason it's so like awesome is because it's all legal, legit, regulated from the bottom, uh, it's from the start by the SEC. Like he hates Wall Street, he hates it, and so he's he's like spearheading it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, basically, right. They're, they're this cool thing. I mean, they basically created an equities, the U.S. equities market. Very interesting. By next year, a five hundred million dollar ICO would be considered small. <laughs> so um, I think that it's, this, we should continue we should continue the discussion, but I think we should sort of call this the end of the presentation and keep talking. Um, thanks so much John for coming. Perfect.